We'll begin our service momentarily. But first, I invite you to finish arriving as we listen to our gathering music. Settle in and prepare for service. Wherever you are, wherever you come from, whatever spiritual path you're on, please arrive now and settle in. What happens when a woman, and thanks for being here. <coughs> Good morning, friends, and welcome to Berrien Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We strive to make this a safe place. We are a caring, open-minded, spiritual community celebrating diversity, welcoming people of all nationalities, sexual orientations, gender expressions, and abilities. We should probably take a few minutes this morning for announcements. Anyone have any the, beyond the ones that are in our order of, order of service and the um, off and outs? I have one, Julie. Ahead, Julie. Uh, you all probably know that uh, President Biden is commemorating uh, Bloody Sunday in uh, Selma in 1965. You may not, uh, and uh, people have criticized the white church, uh, which they should have, for not taking more action in those days. But did you know, some of you know, that Unitarian minister James Reeb 
and Unitarian member Viola Leozzo were murdered at Selma at that time. Other announcements for the good of the community? Okay, several of us have put together today's service to honor International Women's Day, usually celebrated on March 8th. It's a global day celebrating achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating the drive toward women's equality. International Women's Day isn't a country group or organization specific. Uh, it belongs to all groups collectively everywhere. International Women's Day was established in 1908, uh, 1911 time period. Do we still need an International Women's Day? Uh, yes. According to the World Economic Forum, sadly, none of us will see gender parity in our lifetimes nor likely will many of our children. Gender parity will not be attained for almost a century. There is urgent work to do and we can all play a part. Our second UU principle guides us towards justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. These words are from The Soul of Politics by Jim Wallace. At times, I think the truest image of God today is a black inner city grandmother in the United States, or a mother of the disappeared in Argentina, or the women who wake up early to make tortillas in refugee camps. They all weep for their children and in their compassionate tears arises the political action that changes the world. The mothers show us that is the experience of touching the pain of others that is the key to change. Today, we kindle our chalice to help us see these women touch their pain and to lead us with them toward a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. I saw the goddess cross at the green light in front of BK today. She worked her heavy frame across the street on strapless, sandaled feet, her long patterned dress emphasizing her wide mother love hips, her dark skin slightly glistening in the afternoon sun. I saw the goddess today, patiently, slowly, silently, pass in front of impatient traffic, her heavy purse draped across her shoulder, her natural beauty radiating like the heat from the pavement. I saw the goddess today, mother of life, walk incognita across a South Bend city street and could not keep this joy a secret to myself.
Let's take a moment to say our words of affirmation together. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. And we hold space here for those without a community to share. This is She Persisted Around the World, written by Chelsea Clinton, illustrated by Alexandra Boyger. It's profiles of 13 women who changed history. We're going to read only excerpts today of four of those women. It's not always easy being a girl anywhere in the world. It's especially challenging in some places. There are countries where it's hard for girls to go to school and where women need their husband's permission to get a passport or even to leave the house. And all over the world, girls are more likely to told to be quiet, to sit down, to have smaller dreams. Don't listen to those voices. These 13 women from across the world didn't. They persisted. At the time Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz was growing up in Mexico, most girls did not go to school. After reading and studying on her own, Juana Ginez asked her family if she could disguise herself as a boy so she could go to university. They said no. She persisted, finding tutors who didn't mind teaching a girl and then became a nun in part so that she could focus on her studies and her writing. So our Juana Ines's poems and plays are still celebrated today and her respuesta sobre Filotea de la Cruz was the first published argument for a woman's right to education in the Americas. She said, I don't study to know more, but to ignore less. Although Caroline Herschel's mother didn't think girls should be educated, her father taught her alongside her brothers. But after typhus left Caroline permanently stunted at just over four feet tall, both parents thought her only future was to be a servant. She persisted, leaving her native Germany to live in England with her brother William, who supported her efforts to further educate herself, including in math and astronomy. Together they studied the night sky, and on her own, Caroline became the first woman to discover a comet. Today, several of the comets she found bear her name. She said, however long we live, life is short, so I work. As the first woman in East and Central Africa to earn a doctorate degree and become a professor at the University of Nairobi, Wangari Matai made two of her dreams come true. Still, she wanted to do more. Horrified by how many trees had been cut down across Kenya, Wangari started to plant trees. She persisted in getting family, friends, students, and even strangers to help plant more trees and to respect the environment. She also worked hard to protect and defend the rights of everyone in Kenya. Wangari was the first African woman awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Her legacy includes the more than 50 million trees that her Green Belt movement has planted. She said, I don't really know why I care so much. I just have something inside me that tells me there is a problem and I have got to do something about it. When she was growing up in China, Yuan Yuan Tan's father did not want his daughter to take ballet. She persisted in convincing him that being a dancer was her destiny. Finally, her father said that he would decide Yuan Yuan's fate with a coin toss. If the coin landed on heads, she could pursue ballet. If the coin landed on tails, she couldn't. Yuan Yuan won the coin toss. She went on to become among the most famous Chinese ballerinas of all time, winning many awards, dancing around the world, and becoming the youngest principal dancer ever at the San Francisco Ballet, where she still performs today. She said, while I watch other dancers do the same roles I do, I don't try to be anyone else. 
So speak up, rise up, dream big. These women did that and more. They persisted. And so should you. So please join me as I read um, our offering words for the day. We would like to lift up safe shelter and emergency shelter services during our offering today. Safe shelter for domestic violence provides a secure, violence-free environment for survivors of intimate partner violence and sexual assault, along with their dependent children. Emergency shelter services of Berrien County is the only family homeless shelter in the county and serves as the entry point for those at risk of homelessness to access the support they need. Please consider making a donation of financial support to one of these agencies in honor of International Women's Day in the theme of sacred space. Next is There Shall Be Room for All, a responsive reading. I invite those who are here with me today to unmute for the congregational responses. There shall be room for all. We have land and food and water and air. <laughs> Enough to make, to make all, all homes. Um, I, I'll read the slides that say leader. And then if the congregation could join in on the slides that are italicized and say congregation. We have land and food and water and air and heat. Enough to make all homes and all communities comfortable but we've chosen not to share all the space we inhabit. We hope to live in right relations, but we've built and torn down settlements, destroyed land to construct cities and furniture. We've dug mines and shattered graves and taken possession of fields and fish and forests. We do not need to live this way we can learn to, get, to live together a different way, to share our resources and our space with compassion and justice. There shall be enough for all of us if we to live together. together. Our confinement did not begin with this pandemic. We've always been apart as well as together. Some of us commute in cars to jobs in offices and factories. Some of us walk to neighborhood stores and schools to work there. Some of us leave our beds in the morning and just wander until nightfall. Some of us cannot leave our beds at all. We do not all have meaningful work and not all of us do what we might wish. Most of all, we do not eat at the same table. Some do not have enough to eat. Many who have more than enough cannot or do not invite others to their table. We do not know those who could be our guests. Yet yeah. yeah, there would be room for all of us at a table. At a table. Uh, as, as long as, as are our, our intentions. This pandemic has made us more aware of how small our local communities are, but also how remote <coughs> we are from each other. How much happens close to us, behind closed doors, as well as in the public eye, 
in the lives of those we do not yet know. Sometimes in the streets and inside houses, there's danger and fear. Perhaps we need to re redesign our cities, our streets, our houses and institutions, create compassionate and just space, feminist space, inclusive space, to make space for relationships to heal and thrive. But we need not wait for any redesign to practice radical hospitality, radical welcome. We need not wait to make more room and spread love more widely. And and we should be room enough, enough for all in our, in our loving community. community. aside to lift up one group of people that have long been excluded from a place at that table. Why? Why over the last 5,000 years or so have women been systematically held to a limited sphere of influence and power? Two Unitarian Universalist women researched the religious roots of sexism and devaluing of women and they presented their findings in the form of two groundbreaking curricula to help the rest of us learn what happened, why, and what we can do. I'd like to tell you a little bit about these prophetic people I've been privileged to call colleagues and friends. Reverend Dr. Shirley Rank is a theologian and author of the series called Cakes for the Queen of Heaven. It's an 11 session curriculum it brings us a close look at the role of the feminine divine in Western civilizations. Shirley has been a psychologist and UU minister as well as a writer. She's in her 90s, finally retired, and actually lives in Niles, Michigan right now with family. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Fisher was an activist, author, creatrix, and a wise woman who wrote a curriculum honoring the feminine divine around the world. The follow-up to Cakes. 
She called that Rise Up and Call Her Name. In 13 sessions, Rise Up shows us many faces of the goddess. Liz passed away last September in her home in California with their husband and partner activist Bob by her side. Here are some of their words. Liz wrote in her booklet, Women's Rights Are Human Rights. My interest in the International Human Rights Movement for Women's Rights started at an early age in the 1950s. When I could not ignore the inferior status of girls and women around the world. I was a feisty girl with supportive parents whose values included opposing sexism. I made a commitment then to not allow myself to be discriminated against. Not always easy to do by myself, I found out. This dedication to fair treatment was stimulated by both my involvement with liberal religious philosophy as a teen and my interest in the values and principles from my civics classes where I learned that central to being a loyal American was defending liberty and justice for all. I came to realize that so many were left out of the definition of all, women and African Americans, to name a few. Because I was proud to be an American citizen, I felt it was my duty to actively challenge inequities. I met a lot of others who felt as passionate about this responsibility as I did. It took some time, though, to discover the power of participating with others around these concerns. In the 1980s, when I was in my 30s, I became acquainted with the international women's movement through my friends within the Unitarian Universalist Women and Religion Movement, which I joined. Several key colleagues there, women 20 to 30 years older than I was, were deeply involved in the United Nations International Women's Conferences that took place in 1975, 1980, and 1985. They enthusiastically reported back about what had taken place in Mexico City, Copenhagen, and Nairobi, the locations of the conferences. I was encouraged by them to attend the International Non-Governmental Women's Rights Conference near Beijing in 1995, where a plan of action was adopted. Despite controversy both in the US and China about what they disparagingly called the radical feminist agenda, 50,000 women made their way to this gathering in the Huairau dis district of Beijing. Many came after funds were raised by their friends back home. Poor women were sponsored, so the event would be truly representative. I decided, despite major uncertainties in my own life, that it was important to be there. It changed my life to be among these passionate advocates. Reverend Dr. Rank writes, we need to know the truth about female power and its dismemberment and about the desacralization of the earth under patriarchy, because it is part of our history as human beings. And we need to envision and celebrate our oneness even as we learn to rejoice in our colorful diversity. We do not come to invade or colonize, but to remember and create together a new vision for the future. In the process of writing Cakes for the Queen of Heaven, I discovered some aspects of pre-patriarchal religion <clears throat> that I had not expected. Perhaps the most important was reverence for the earth and the cycles of nature. As a thoroughly urban person, I was only minimally aware of the phases of the moon, the coming of an equinox or solstice. I had long been in love with the crashing waves and iridescent life of the oceans. I had stared in wonder at the beauty of the California redwoods. But I had related these feelings only peripherally to my religion. For the old religions, Earth was another name for the divine female creator. I learned to sing, we all come from the goddess, and to her we shall return like a drop of rain flowing to the ocean. I 
begin to see the connection between the dishonoring of women and the exploitation of the earth. Cakes was about women and their lives. While we meditated upon the phases of the moon and called for harmony with Earth's elements, we did not take up directly the relationship between the powerlessness of women and the ecological crisis of the Earth. We need to make central a new respect for the Earth and for women. When you look in your sister's eyes, praise her, praise her, for she's been laid down for centuries. When you look in your sister's eyes, praise her, praise her, for she's been laid down for centuries. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah When you look in your sister's eyes Praise her, praise her For she's been laid down For centuries When you look in your sister's eyes Praise her, praise her She's been laid down for centuries When you look in your sister's eyes Praise her, praise her For she's been laid down for centuries Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah When you look in your sister's eyes Praise her, praise her, for she's been laid down for centuries. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. May we no longer be silent, for now we know that our words help others to speak. May we stand up and say our own names, learn the names of other peoples and people, say their name, say her name. May we no longer be afraid, for now we know that our words can be a way for others to follow as well as to lead us up to the podium. May we no longer be still, for now we know that our minds and hearts move through space and time towards others, towards all that we know is good.
We extinguish the chalice of this gathering, still knowing that its symbolic flame remains with us. We know that both the light and the darkness hold their own opportunities, that the moon is full, even when it is a small remnant of visible light, that our words and actions make a difference, even when they are largely unseen and unheard. We carry from ourselves to others, from here to there, from yesterday to tomorrow, all we need to bring into the world. When our bodies are distant from each other, May our spirits join together in loving community.